It is gray screen. Yeah. Look at that. This is just DCL. All right, Matt's a little taller. We need to back up the uh, camera. <laughs> or maybe just angle it up. Yeah, just give it the young angle. Hi, everyone. Hey Welcome to. <laughs> Welcome. Well, we're excited that y'all joining us for our training week. It's going to be an awesome opportunity tonight for a couple hours, and then again Wednesday night from 7 to 9, Thursday night from 7 to 9, and then again on Saturday from 1 to 5. And half of that, the second half of Saturday's time, will be a time out getting to, to share with people, coming back and celebrating what God's done. So thank you for joining us. We're going to jump in, and I think, uh, first off, I just want to start with prayer. Lord, thank you for bringing us together. I pray that uh, you have handpicked the people that uh, need to hear the training time to not only hear, to know, but to practice and obey. And Lord, we're excited about uh, putting into practice the things you're teaching us. Help us, Lord, uh, to be ones who are uh, just super learners, ones that come before you uh, just humble, ready to, to learn, to uh, even get down things that we may have uh, learned before, but we're, we're learning them and, and relearning them. Get them down solid where we, it's second nature in everything we do. Thank you, Lord. In Christ's name, amen. All right. Well, I just want to start out just uh, mentioning we want to know what God's heart is. When it comes to uh, accomplishing his will, being on mission, uh, we can just do things by road, things we feel obligated to do, things that seem like, well, this is the right thing. But if we ever see in God's heart, first and foremost, uh, we are going to be all more uh, affected in our heart and allow our hearts to drive what we do, uh, not out of obligation, uh, not out of uh, just wanting to uh, impress or do things for other people, but we want to serve God first and foremost. So I just want to go through a, a few key verses, and uh, I think just for those of us here, uh, I'm going to ask you all to uh, share those verses, and I'm just going to break it down into... Uh, into three parts, and let me get here. We're just gonna put the scripture. Then we've got. Skin of God's desire. And then who God uses for his mission. Let's just want to draw some lines here. Now let's just start out. I'm going to ask some of y'all to uh, just come up and read the verse. First one would be Genesis chapter one, verse twenty-seven and twenty-eight. Uh, if you come on up and, and read that, drop that down. Thing in front of the camera. So right here is good. All right, go for it. Jump in there. Okay. Uh, Genesis 1, 27, 28, says, uh, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Thank you. Woo. All right. So Genesis 1, 27, 28. So what did y'all capture from that as far as the extent of God's desire? What would you say? Any thoughts there? 
in that verse? For us to subdue it? Everything. Everything. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Everything on earth. Here we go. And so, who does God use to accomplish this mission? Man and children. Yeah. I'll just put mankind. Okay. And we're just going to hit just a few verses in here, but I think it highlights what God is, is up to. Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3. David. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. All right. So, Genesis 12, 1 through 3. The extent of God's desire. Who does he want to bless? Us. All families. Say it again. All families. All right. All families. All right. And... Who does God use for that mission? Abraham. Abraham. His, his chosen man and for his chosen people, I'm, just, I'm going to put, uh, he chose, um, let's put his chosen people. All right, cool. Well, um, I'm going to do one more Old Testament verse. Psalm 67, verse 1 through 4. That passage, Justin, could you read that? Yeah. God be gracious to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us. Selah. That your way may be known on the earth, your salvation among all nations. Let the people praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you will judge the people with uprightness and guide the nations on the earth. All right, so we'll put Psalm 67, 1 through 4. And what's the extent of God's desire? Um, all the peoples. All the ends of the earth. Uh -huh. And, and who does God want to use for this mission? Us. Alright. The peoples. Alright. Good. Well, let's, let's just tackle uh, you know Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Who can say that by memory? Adam, you can, you can read it or say it. Come on up. No, I'm nervous. Don't pass out. And Jesus came, and Jesus came, and Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Cool. Thank you. And uh, we'll go to Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Okay, so, extent of God's desire. What's your... Wanting to reach? All right. 
to And us. who's got user's mission? Us. His disciples. His disciples. Good. Another familiar verse, Acts 1 8. Jan, you got that one? All right. And you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. All right. So again, Acts 1 8. Extent of God's desire, who does he want to reach? End of the earth. All right, end of the earth. And who does he want to use? But there again, his disciples. All right, so lastly, I'm going to mention uh, a verse in Revelation. Uh, Revelation, actually, you can do both. Kelly, if you can do both. Revelation 5, 9 through 10, and 7, 9. Okay, so picture what things are going to look like when Christ returns. Uh, Revelation 5, 9 through 10. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals. For you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. And Re Revelation 7, 9 says, After these things, I looked and behold a great multitude, which no one could count, from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, and palm branches were in their hands. Okay. So I write that down. Revelation 5, that's um, verses 9 and 10, and 7, verses 9. Okay, so what, what was that vision that, that uh, John saw? What was the extent of the people that he saw? No one can count. Yeah. Uh, I'll put every right, every tribe and this who God uses for his mission may not be as evident in that passage but it really is um, his disciples these guys us enabled every tribe to be there, uh, just at God's throne in Revelation. It's pretty, pretty amazing to know that uh, this is God's heart. As we see, and these are just a, a few passages that emphasize that, but we see that, that from the very beginning, from Genesis when uh, God created the earth, put man on the earth, from that very beginning, uh, his heart was that all men would know him as known. We know the fall happened, man was separated from God, but God's plan all along was that men would know him and that uh, he had a game plan with Christ coming that all men could know him and have their sins forgiven and be with him eternally. So we know God's heart. That's not a that's something we have to guess at, but if this is God's heart, well then we're, as his children, are to be about pursuing what's on God's heart and to be in prayer about, okay, if, if that's God's heart, I want my heart to reflect that. All the more, uh, that's what I want to be desperate about. So for these next, uh, for this week,
and the course of, of several training times, uh, we're going to be working on just developing a, an understanding of tools, practicing those so that we can be those disciple makers that we talked about, ones who uh, are able to convey God's heart and see people uh, one to him. And so one thing I'm going to uh, mention is a distinction. Is hey, come in, Dex. Have a seat. Uh, we're, um, we're I'm going to mention this: the difference between training and teaching. Both are important, both need to happen, um, but what we find with teaching, there's a sense that we're de developing people with growing knowledge. Whereas in training, we're, we're working out just ways that we're developing skills in our life. So both, again, are important, but what we're going to focus on is, is developing these skills in, in people's lives. So it, it comes about through practice. We've got where we're, we're doing over and over what I would call reps. <laughs> that we're, we're just by practicing different tools, uh, we're going over them again until they just get to be uh, second nature in our lives. And so I, one thing I want to encourage is, is we're doing this. Practice is so key. Uh, when we go over things, they may even be tools that you've seen before, uh, but they, they may be rusty. Things that uh, I, I think we all need to just continue to practice over time. But we're going to take time to practice things. I would encourage you to uh, have somebody that you're, you're paired up with. Uh, I would call them, you know, let's just have training buddies. And those training buddies during this week, um, if, if you're on Zoom, uh, we'll just line you up, we'll pair you up with somebody uh, just through the, the breakout rooms. And so if, if you're either here where there's, uh, we, can, we can break it down uh, together, or if you're uh, on Zoom and you've got other people with you, you can break down together and practice right where you're at. But we'll take care of if you're uh, on your own, we'll break you out into breakout rooms. But before, we're going to do that in just a second. But before we do, I'm just going to mention one more thing. Um, and that's that relates to what I call the, the brutal facts. Brutal facts. And so there These are things that, that statistically um, we need to be aware of. What we're dealing with, with when, we, when we talk about uh, the world around us. Now, I'm going to just throw out some statistics um, from, uh, there's been different, probably the, probably the, the, the most uh, strategic, relevant, up-to-date statistics come from Barna Research. But uh, I'll put a number 50%. Roughly, population that would be considered unchurched in the U.S. And so we're dealing with uh, 328,000 or million people 
328 million. So that means what is that 164 million are considered unchurched. Now, uh, already we know there's church people that don't know Jesus. But uh, just to be on the conservative end of things, if we're talking about just unchurched people, uh, in our country alone, 164 million people that uh, desperately need to hear the gospel, uh, to have a relationship with Christ. Now, of those 164 million, or 50%, 34% You would, uh, they're considered, uh, I use the label skeptics, or even um, those would be atheists, agnostic. Um, well, we had a, a good session uh, with Steiger Ministries, and, and their focus was specifically on skeptics and how to reach them for the gospel. So, again, I'm not excluding those, but if, again, if we're being really conservative, uh, if we just took away the skeptics from this number, you end up with how many do you have left? Well, that's 33% of the population of our country are unchurched people that are not skeptics. So those are people that they, um, for some reason, uh, they don't darken the door of a church and uh, they're not typically going to, but, uh, but they're open. There's a sense that uh, they're not rejecting God, they're not rejecting Jesus, but they haven't had uh, the encounters, the, the gospel shared in, in different seeds planted uh, to respond and to, to get saved to be a part of fellowship. So uh, that's, to me, that's, that's encouraging that we have uh, this, this group that's available to reach. And so I'll say just a, a real sad statistic, uh, the percentage of people that actually evangelical Christians that actually share their faith. You know what that percentage is? Only 3%. I'll just put Christians. Share the gospel. And so that's, uh, that's a staggering number. If only 3% of those uh, who are saved actually are engaged in sharing the gospel, boy, uh, there is, that means there's so many on the sidelines, 97% of all Christians on the sidelines. Well, our hope is that that number, uh, that 3% will grow and that we can be a part how God may use us to, to train others to be effective in the gospel. And so uh, just the simple tools we go through here are things that will be reproducible in other people's lives, things that we can help others to, to be a part of laborers that, that Christ is calling into the harvest. And so uh, some encouraging things, other statistics, they say that, uh, if 10% of a, of a community, of a population, know something, they influence the rest of the 90% to actually know that. Um, that's encouraging. And that 1% of those who actually labor will affect the other 99%. And so laborers in the harvest, even if it were at 1%, uh, it will influence significantly the rest of the population. Mm. So we have that as a, as a challenge as well as a, a hope. And God has us here on this earth for a reason. And it's exciting that uh, he wants, he, he's chosen to use each one of you to be a part of uh, his witnesses, his disciples, that he's charged to be a part of, of his heart of reaching this world. So what I want you to do right now, I want you to uh, just briefly break down into uh, 
uh, your parish, uh, your buddies, and I want you to just uh, talk about what do you think uh, in the population that you're reaching out to, the University of Florida, Gainesville at large, uh, what do you think the percentage of people are uh, are not saved? Uh, talk about that. And also, I want you to just uh, talk briefly about what do you hope to get out of this time this week as we go through the training? So uh, just take a, a couple minutes, and then we'll bring you back together. So go ahead and break out. Go for it. Thanks.
Okay. Oh, there Good. Well, welcome back. Hopefully, um, it was a great start. Thanks, Matt. I, you know, I always appreciate uh, how we just, if we capture God's heart, it really, um, if all Christians were to capture God's heart, who knows uh, what would happen. We would really shake up the world. And verse that always encouraging to me. Uh, so you got to have verses that you cling to that remind you of God's plan. For my one of the main ones is First Timothy two, uh, chapter two, verse four. He says, "Who desires all men?" Talk about God. With back up, says, "This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth." That's God's heart. He wants all people, and uh, we catch that. Hopefully, you've caught that. And when we understand God's heart, what's cool is and we we hit the ground running, right? But, uh, but how? How do we do this? How do we, what is God's plan to reach the world? And we see that in different places in scripture, but, uh, but when you study scripture, uh, we're going to use a tool called the five parts, four fields. It helps us identify really that God had a strategy and Jesus had a strategy when he was here on earth. And not only a strategy that he followed, but one that he gave his disciples to follow. And we see that played out through uh, in Acts and throughout the New Testament, but it's a strategy that he wants us to follow as well. And there's five parts to this strategy um, the first part that we're going to identify, and that's really what these next couple days are for, is we're going to go through each part of God's strategy, Jesus' strategy of making disciples, of reaching the lost and making disciples who make disciples. So the first part, the first uh, part of the strategy is an entry plan. You need to have an entry plan to where you're going to go. This kind of answers the question of um, who you're going to go to and, uh, and how are you going to, how are you going to engage, how are you going to engage with the lost around you. Um, we're going to talk about that and answer that question actually a little bit more today. The second part is a gospel plan. What is the gospel? What is the content you're going to communicate? What's a simple way to communicate God's message of the gospel? Um, and we're going to tackle that plan. The third part of God's plan is, uh, is discipleship. How are you going to disciple others? How are you going to help people grow from from infant babies to mature Christians and be able to reproduce themselves. The second part is discipleship. The, the fourth part is church. How are you going to do church? How are you going to live out uh, being God's body right here on earth? And how did Jesus do that? We're going to look at it. And how does he want us to do the same? And then the fifth part that we'll look at is leadership. How will we reproduce the same process and continue on. How will we raise up leaders? And we'll take a look at Jesus' plan to do that. So hopefully over the next couple of days, we'll be able to identify and really answer these questions uh, for us as a church, but even for each one individually to be able to answer how you accomplish um, each one of those parts. And one way to, this, to kind of describe this whole thing or to, to lay this out is uh, what a tool we've seen used is called Four Fields. Yeah. So if you have a sheet of paper, I'd recommend you draw this out um, and uh, don't mind me, I'm not the best drawer, so if you aren't either, that's fine. We'll try to use some simple, simple ways here. Let's start with a square. Big circle in the middle. All right. And the tool we'll use is something called leadership, um, four fields. And you can kind of look at this, you see the scripture, sometimes we'll use the verse, uh, the passages in, um, uh, passage in Mark, or Mark 4, it talks about the four fields and a farmer going out. But a great analogy is when you have four different fields, uh, first you're going to have the field of the, the farmer. Uh, you know, a farmer analogy. And he's going to start with an uh, um, empty field, right? So you got a farmer, a little farmer hat, keep the sun off him, and he's got to go into a field, and it's an empty field, right? You start with an empty field, there's nothing there. And then once he's in the field, he's going to start planting seeds. All on the field. He wants to plant lots of seeds to see lots of crops come. And over time, those crops will start to grow, and he'll see some growth happen. And after a while, when the, after uh, the crops grow, you'll eventually have to, to, to harvest those crops and gather them up and, and harvest them. And then all the while, uh, to continue for next year's crops, is going to replant seeds. He's going to replant and send out some of those same crops to see the process happen again. And this simple diagram you can see is we can, we can add these five different parts into this diagram. The first part is the entry. The 
the first field, sorry, is the entry field. This is the empty field that we're going to go to. The empty field that we, uh, where are we going to go to reach lostness? Where are we going to go to reach people who don't know Jesus? We have to find a place to go. The second field is the gospel field. This kind of answers that question, what are we going to share with them? Uh, we're going to share the gospel, right? We're going to share ways to, to, to engage with them and tell them about the kingdom. And so we want simple tools that are reproducible, um, but also biblical. So simple tools that we can see multiply into people's life, uh, but also are biblical, come from what we see in the scriptures. The third field where the, the crop starts growing is the discipleship field, or the, uh, the growing field. We want to help people grow, right? We don't want to just see the, the plant start grow, um, just the plant seed. We want to see that seed mature. We want to see growth happen. This is how we answer How do we disciple people? How do we help them grow in their food? And then the, uh, the fourth field is that church field. How are we going to gather as church? How are we going to gather people together to help them to continue to grow and reproduce and see leadership happen? But how do we gather people to live out being the church as well? And then the fifth field or the fifth part is leadership, we talked about. How will we raise up leaders and see the same process reproduce, see people sent out and continue the same uh, process, the same four fields, uh, five parts. So, so it's a simple tool to kind of identify these. And what we see in scripture and what we see even in, in, as we look across the kingdom now, and we see uh, uh, stuff that's really growing and multiplying, multiplying rapidly, is they have an answer to these five fields, or these five parts. It's not the same for everybody, but we've got to be able to answer these questions. How are we going to enter into a field? How, what, what's the gospel tool that we're going to share? How are we going to disciple people? How are we going to gather as church? And how are we going to multiply our leadership and see disciples who are raising us disciples, disciples who are making disciples? And again, my hope is by the end of this time, you'll be able to identify those same tools and be able to be, feel equipped to do that same process that we see in the scriptures. So what I want to do is I want to discover this. It's not just something we made up. It's not just something that like, hey, this is a cool little design to work. Um, but you can see that, that Jesus had the same strategy in the scriptures. And there's lots of different places. You can look in uh, all throughout the Gospels, all throughout in the New Testament. Uh, what I'll look at today is actually a new one for some of us. Uh, we're going to look in Matthew chapter 9. Um, so if you have your Bible, turn to Matthew 9. And we are going to look... Uh, we're going to start in verse 35. Popular passage, uh, we talk, Jesus talks about raising, uh, um, uh, praying for laborers. And we're going to look to see how Jesus followed this same strategy in his own life uh, together. So Matthew 9, verse 35. Uh, so what I want to do is I'm going to read the scripture, and we're going to identify how Jesus entered into a field. What did he do? Uh, who did he go to? Um, what was his entry strategy there? What did he share for the gospel? What was his gospel message? What did he do to disciple, to, to train mature people? What did he do to gather them for church? And was there a leadership aspect involved there? Was there leadership going on? So um, I'll go ahead and read it out loud, and then we'll go from there. So thank you. Is that better one? That's sweet. Oh, that one smells too. So. <laughs> All right, I'm going to read it. Uh, it says uh, just a couple verses. Verse uh, ch Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 says, Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits and to cast them out and to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Popular passage, you know, but you can identify here. What did you, what do we see as Jesus' entry here? What did he do? Um, right there in the beginning, in verse 35, it says, Jesus was going through all the cities and villages. So he went, he was going to the cities and the villages. You see Jesus going, he's got verse 35. And specifically, it says, all the cities and the villages. Uh, so there's kind of his entry strategy. He was on the mission. He was on the move, going to these places to share, going to these places to talk to others. And then what was his gospel message? It goes on in that verse. It says, going through the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. So you see him teaching and proclaiming the gospel. So there's an idea of he's teaching, sharing, the, sharing about himself. See that verse 35? And he's proclaiming 
proclaiming the gospel. This is kind of like the idea of uh, whether they're listening or not, he's sharing with others this gospel message. Uh, kind of like, a, uh, hey, I'm going to just go and share out everyone. It's kind of a shout at the rooftop to let everyone know the, the, the message of the gospel. But he was also going, what else was he doing there? He was healing. Um, so not only was he proclaiming, but he was also serving the people. And you see that he was healing others. Uh, in verse 35, he's healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. So you see this idea of healing others and serving their need, meeting their needs, helping reach that. Same thing with us with the gospel, right? Not just sharing with others, we want to serve others, we want to help them in that same process. So after that, what, is it, what did he do to disciple? What did he do to help grow people? Well, you can read in there. I think this teaching aspect could be part of the gospel, but also could be, I think he was teaching others about the kingdom. Not just the gospel message, but here he was teaching them what it means to grow as a disciple, what it means to mature as a disciple. He's also going on in 37. What does he say? He says, he said, the disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. He was casting vision. He was vision casting, helping his saints, helping the disciples know uh, what he wants to, how he wants to use them, what he wants to do in their life, and what he wants them to be doing as well. So you see this idea of maturing them and helping them grow. And then the last thing is he teaches them how to pray. In verse 30, 38, he says, therefore, beseech the Lord of harvest to send out workers into his harvest. He's teaching them how to pray. So again, that's part of maturity, part of growth there as well. Cool. All right, let's look at the church. What did he do uh, to gather his people? Uh, well, you see that in verse 1 of chapter 10. It says that Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and heal every kind of disease and every kind of movement. Jesus summoned them. He brought them together. He said, come to me. And there's this idea that he's, uh, he brought them to himself. And he was gathering, not only did he, hey, uh, we got to proclaim these things, but Jesus was gathering people together to do church, to do life together. You see that. And the last aspect is leadership. What did Jesus do for leadership? He gave them authority, and he sent them out to do the same. Um, so you see that in verse 1 as well. He gave authority to the disciples and sent them out to do the same. So you see Jesus right here, just these few verses, you see Jesus was following the same system. And again, it's not just here, but it's all throughout. You can see this uh, in, in the beginning of Matthew. You can see this in the beginning of Mark, where Jesus was following the same, um, same strategy to reach the world. He entered into a new place. He proclaimed the gospel, proclaimed himself. He healed others. He, bled, he, he um, served their needs. He started teaching others, giving vision, and teaching people how to pray, and among other things, he gathered people into himself, and he sent them back out in authority. And then what do you see in the next couple of verses? You see that the 12 disciples are called. The 12 are gathered and become part of Jesus' plan. But what's cool is it's not just Jesus that follows this strategy, but his disciples do the same. And if you read in the next uh, about 10 verses of chapter 10, you're going to see that same idea. You're going to see what the disciples did when they heard this. So what I want you to do is we're going to break down into our, our, our groups again with our training buddies. And we're going to read the next 10 verses. Uh, we're going to go chapter 10. Actually, uh, you can skip over. You can just start with verse 5. So it's Matthew 10. Start with 5. And just read through about 11. Um, so just a couple of verses. And I want you to identify what did the disciples do. And how did, well, did, uh, see how where you can identify things on this same uh, four fields diagram. Where did the disciples go for entry? Where did they go? What did they do for the gospel? What did they do for uh, hoping people... To grow in their faith, discipleship. What do they do for church? How do they gather? And how much leadership is there? So see if you can identify all those different parts in these next couple of verses. Take about um, five minutes to do that. Through verse 11, you said? Yes, through verse 11. So Matthew chapter 10, start with verse 5 and go through 11. So, and there should be stuff for all five. Uh, there should be stuff. Uh, you may not get the last one. So leadership might not be there. So if you don't find that, that's okay. So go ahead and break out your rooms. Mm -hmm. 
So, as you go, I don't know. Is that here? Hello? Thank you. Thank you. When you're in a group, you the other all right, you guys will be all right. You guys will discuss with each other. Just read that passage, Matthew chapter um, 10. 10. 10. Yeah, so we just looked at how Jesus did it. Now we're looking at Matthew 10, 5 through 11.
All right, welcome back. Hopefully, you had enough time to discover uh, Jesus as he as he shared that with the disciples. And there was a good clarifier in our group here. It wasn't uh, we don't know if the from this one passage we don't see the disciples actually did this. We see this is what Jesus explained right. to them to go do. So, but uh, but again, that idea is it's not just what Jesus did, but he wanted us to do the same. And as you read on, you will see that they that they did this. So um, let's see if you can identify it. So what uh, the entry strategy? Uh, what was Jesus saying for his entry strategy? What did he tell him to do for entry? Go to the house of Israel. Yeah, okay. Yeah, he said go, right? <laughs> Again, he's going. He specifically told him to go to the house of Israel. We see that in verse, uh, I believe it's 6. He said to go in verse 6. Uh, same thing there. It's kind of, we see that like, great commission in some ways, right? But he, we're, we're on the move. We're, we're going to these new places of lostness. All right, and then what's, what's the gospel message he tells him to share? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Yeah. So he says, uh, he said, before he even says that, he says to preach. Uh, so in verse 7, he says, preach. Verse 7. And then he says, he claims the gospel message. He talks about the kingdom again. Mm -hmm. He's talking about the kingdom. Same message he said before. Proclaiming the kingdom message is at hand. And what else? Was there anything else that they did for, um, for the gospel message? Healing. Yeah, yeah, same thing, right? He asked, he told them to heal the sick, uh, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons, right? So again, you see healing as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, serving people, meeting their their needs. <laughs> Verse eight. All right, all right. What did you guys get for this discipleship of the saints? What did he What did he tell them to do for discipleship? Freely give. Yes, freely give. Right. So they're supposed to give away all their money. No, only the stuff that they received for free. Right, right. Well, in some ways, <laughs> in some ways, they didn't have any money, right? Jesus said, "Don't take anything with you." So it wasn't the money they were supposed to give. But I, I think uh, you could you can make a case for that. He was saying, "Hey, give them the same things I gave you." Just like in the Great Commission, right? Teach others the same things I taught you. Um, the same thing. Hey, I'm teaching you these things. I'm giving you these commands. Jesus tells disciples to do the same. Freely give these to others, right? So you can see his discipleship is a pass on. These same commands, these same strategy. You see that in verse I believe it's eight as well. Yes, yeah. Verse eight. All right. And what was? Uh, how did he gather people for church? What did he tell them to do? In the house. Yeah, he said in verse um, verse eleven. It says, "Whatever city or village you enter, inquire who's worthy, and stay in his house until you leave that city." So if they receive you, he said, "Stay there, gather them, disciple them, train them, gather, help them reach." Others in that city as well. So this idea that he's gathering people, verse 11 says, stay at that home. Stay at the home and continue to teach them. Verse 11. All right, you don't really see the issue. What did you guys get for leadership? We said the whole thing. Yeah. It was Jesus telling them. <laughs> right, yeah. So one group said the whole thing. Jesus, right, giving them, uh, telling them, instructing them how to do it. Uh, so you can see that leadership. And the other is you really see leadership as you continue on in the Gospels, right? You see that uh, they in Acts, you can really just write the book of Acts. Uh, so it's kind of cheating a little bit, but as you know, the scriptures you can see in, in Acts, you see that leadership happening, right? They multiply themselves. You see the disciples pass this on to others. But hopefully, you're gathering that this strategy was not just for Jesus, this strategy was not just for his 12 disciples. This same strategy God wants us to use to reach the world as we fulfill his heart of seeing all people come to an hour of the truth. So that's our hope is, as, as we get through the night and that's it. Today we're going, we're going to go into the entry field a little bit more, into this field, this part, and how we can discover that. Um, but that's, but as, you're, as you think these next couple days, be thinking of, of specifically being able to answer these five questions for yourself and how you can pass that on to others. Questions? Good. Here's what I want you to do. Break out of your room. You have three minutes. Uh, just explain uh, you don't have to draw it out. Remember, just explain the five parts and four fields. You can use your diagram you already did. Explain the five parts. Kind of like just the, the farmer analogy. But explain the five parts and the four fields and what that is and why we're, why we're using that. So you have about three minutes. Go. So, uh, first part, what uh, Jesus said to
When it's time, I'm on. Okay. It's on muted. Okay. How much time I got? Am I good? Oh my God! Yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no one man. All right. So the rest of tonight, the next hour we're going to do is we're going to cover the entry field, and really just the first part of it is who do we uh, who do we go to? Who do we reach? And I like to tell people, I remind you, there's only two types of people in the world, right? What are the two types? Men and women. Men and women is one. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I'm going to say there's two types. There's the lost and then the saved. Right? And there's believers and unbelievers. There's those that know Jesus, have trusted him Savior, and those are not. It's black and white in a lot of ways. And uh, what do we do with lost people? We want to see them what? Get saved, right? We want to see lost people come to know Jesus. And what, do we, what about saved people? We want to see them lost. No, we don't want to see them lost. We want to train them, right? We want to help them mature as believers and be able to do the same. So what we're going to talk about is really the entry for lost people. And then when you break down lost people, there's, I would say you can put them in another two different categories. There's probably other categories you can put them in. But two other categories. Uh, what what two would you guess I go on with here? Red, Red yellow, yellow, green light. What? Red, yellow, green light. Red, no, that's, that's that'd be close. Yeah. No. All right. The two red, uh, different tools. I want to say those you know and those you don't know. Oh. Because there's a certain amount of people you know, and there's a certain amount of people you don't know. So, um, so uh, I'm just gonna write no, trying the best way, and don't know. All right. And so what we're gonna tackle first is how do we engage or how do we who do we go to the ones that we know. And so I'm gonna get stuck there. So Adam is gonna come up and share woo, uh, a tool to help us um, engage with those that we know. So right. take it away, Adam. Uh, Hello. Well, I don't know about you guys, but I know some people. <laughs> so, so the tool we're gonna to talk about today is the names map. So I hope you're familiar. If you're not, uh, this will be a good new introduction for you. But it's really useful to update your names map every once in a while because you, especially during this past few months, we've met a lot of new people or maybe not met that many people. But um, it's good to stay updated. Uh, so, why do we need a name map? Because we have people in our lives that we interact with on a daily basis, um, unless you are like JD. But. <laughs> <laughs> you have, and you stay in your moment. Right. Um, so, um, and, and these people need prayer, they need love, uh, they need service, and they need to um, hear the gospel. So, uh, my name is Matt. I'll, I'll demo it for you and then you can practice it later. But, um, so, my name is Matt, looks like this. In the middle, there's a circle with my name is. I'm Adam. Adam. So I'll draw arrows going to um, people around me that I know. So I know Brandon, he's a co worker. I know Devin, uh, I know Richard, and there's my family. And my cousin, Maddie. Um, and I interact with all these people at least on a weekly basis. Now, when we interact with these people, it's, it's good to be, to be focused. We want them all to hear the gospel. We want them all to come to the knowledge of Christ, right? Um, but they also know people around them. And those people around them can come to know Jesus as well. So I know Richard has a wife. And he has 10 kids. 10? 10. Almost 11. That's all? <laughs> That's <laughs> um, um, I know my cousin has a girlfriend, um, Ginger. Um, I know Devin has a wife. 
So it would be really awesome if uh, one of these people heard the gospel and then shared it with their family or with their friends. Um, so we, we just see that multiplication going on that we see so much in the book of Acts. Uh, so that's how you make your names map. Uh, now, how do we use it? Uh, if you're in the Discord of the GCL, some of you aren't, but um, he, Matt gave some good ideas about how to use our names map. Uh, one of those good ideas is to pray daily for all the people on it. Uh, some good suggestions for that include like, uh, putting it as a bookmark in your Bible, just a little note card, and you can read daily and then pray. Pray for those people around you uh, to help you stay focused. Another good idea was to um, put it in a, a plastic baggie and put it in your shower so you can oh. multitask. Hmm. I liked that one. Uh, and then he gave another great suggestion which was to text those people, uh, let them know that you're praying for them, let them know that you're grateful for them, um, maybe ask them things that they could, um, might, might want prayer for. Uh, but really just communicating with those people to um, keep that line open. Uh, yeah, so uh, that was a really quick tool. Let's all just uh, go and practice it. So we'll do breakout rooms again, but we'll take five minutes maybe with you and uh, to your partner. All right, you, you and your partner to um, make names maps and pray for each other's names maps. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, Sophia. Hello. Hello, I welcome. Can't hear you. <laughs> can you hear me? Oh, yeah, no, I can. I'm Good. Like hey, we, we just broke out in the, to breakout rooms for okay. a names map. So let me. Um... I was like, oh, no. <laughs> you missed it all. So um, here, I'll put you in a, a breakout room. Uh, actually, they're just in the middle of it. So can I just hold off and I'll get you one the next time? Yeah, I, okay. I think I, I think I know how to do these maps. Okay, good. So just, <laughs> just sit try for a minute. <laughs> yeah, sounds good.
All right, um, I'm Burke Wilson, and I'm going to take us here a little bit uh, for this next module. Matthew uh, Chilton and um, um, Ali Gagna, Gagnon, uh, their uh, students. Matthew was with us his freshman year at NC State. Now he's um, over at Greensboro, and, and Ali's, uh, I think she shall still be with us at NC State. It depends on whether we open up. But um, I want to talk, we want to talk a little bit about. Um, this whole idea of a person of peace and, and for us to remember that, yes, we, we want to be sharing the gospel, but it's not enough for us to share the gospel, right? We've got to understand that we, we want to help others follow Christ to share the gospel because God has the world on his heart. And, and so um, it's not just about getting our gospel reps in. It's about looking for people of peace to make it pop. All right, and so um, and uh, so even thinking along those lines, um, I mean, like, yeah, and you never know. I mean, you know, you you want to have your oikos, you want to be praying like Adam shared, and you know, you want to be praying, and you want to be getting to a point where you're learning about them, and and you're offering help, and you're volunteering um, your story, and even volunteering the gospel pretty good quickly. You know, um, you want to kind of have a thing, a gauge of your oikos. But let's just face it, sometimes your oikos doesn't really respond the way you want to. And since God has promised that the fields are white for harvest, we've got to be willing to get out of our comfort zone. You know, we've got to be willing to uh, rearrange our calendar to find those people of peace. And, and um, even like, again, you know, people who will seem to grasp it just sometime quicker and will multiply. It. There was a there was a waitress in. Um, and she was, you know, serving, and, and this uh, friend of mine uh, went over his story, he got ready to pray, and, and uh, she seemed real receptive, he went over the gospel next, and she, it seemed like it, but she um, never really responded to him, and, um, well, the long story was, one of the reasons she wasn't responding to him was because she was still caught in sin, she was sleeping around, and she was strung out on drugs, and then one night, you know, she had an accident, um, she was high on acid and had an accident. Police arrested her and just, you know, um, man, she knew right then she was at a low point. And so she not only accepted Christ, she got back with this person and um, kicked the drug habit. I mean, God just replaced her addiction to drugs to her addiction to Jesus. And now she is just going, she, she is going into a, a drug addicts and seeing them hear the gospel. And so that, that was not her, their normal oikos, but they were willing to kind of go in and find that person of peace. And, and I want to kind of go over two things about what does it mean to be a person of peace? And then I want us to look at a passage and then let uh, Matthew and Allie um, kind of share their story of uh, what they've been seeing even uh, in their community. But, um, you know, as, as we go through this, um, the uh i'm gonna try to i don't you know a, a person of peace all right i don't know whether y'all see that all right you know and i, I want to look at john chapter four um four through 40. and can you see that can you write that down all right now what i'm going to do I'm going to story it, and then we're going to break down in our, our, our groups and give you all about three or four minutes to retell what I've told. So you don't have to get it perfect, but I, I just want us to kind of look at this. And so here, you know, Jesus is traveling, and he's tired, and he kind of sits down while his disciples go and get some food. And this woman comes out to draw water from the well. And so Jesus starts this dialogue and he asks for water. And so she kind of says, hey, look, you know, you're Jewish. I'm Samaritan. We don't have any dealings. What are you doing talking with me? And then they get into a spiritual conversation and they start talking about living water. And they talk about where to worship in the temple. And uh, so Jesus says, hey, invite your husband to come and let's dialogue. And she says, I have no husband. 
And then Jesus says, you're right. You don't have a husband right now. You've had five husbands. And in fact, the man you're living with is not your husband. And so she says, oh, I perceive you must be a prophet. And so he says, um, you know, and, and, she, and then she goes on. She says something like, you know, hey, when the Messiah comes, he's going to explain all this. He's going to straighten all this out. And um, he's, he goes on and says, I tell you the truth, the one you're talking to am he. I am the Messiah. All right. So I want you all to let's break down. I want you to retell what I just told you to, uh, to the people on your, your breakout rooms. All right. Can we do that? All right, is everybody back? I guess, I, well, I can't hear you, you're all muted. But um, so again, with that backdrop and what what's going on, 
you know, I want to look at a couple of verses because here is this woman who has had five husbands and she's living with a man and Jesus is interacting. And so look at verse 28, uh, start in verse 28. Then leaving her water jar, remember she came for the water, but, uh, and, but she leaves her water jar. The woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ, the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. So again, realize what's happening. Here is this woman who is going back to people who probably gossiped about her, ridiculed her, made fun of her. You know, she is going back to tell them about the Messiah. And so now Jesus, while she's going back in the town, Jesus has this interaction with the disciples. And the, now the crowd is coming to him and he is telling them, lift up your eyes, the fields are white for harvest. And then skip into verse 39. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. And then skip down to verse 42. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said, now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. Now, I want, I want you to understand, you know, here is, this is, this is not a story about racial reconciliation. This is a story about the person God is willing to use to impact a town. You know, I mean, think about this. You know, you might think a, a town, you, you've got an office complex, you've got a, an apartment complex, you've got a neighborhood, you've got a dormitory, you've got your town. And, and God is willing to use this person, no matter what their background is. Now, I don't know about you, but let's be honest, if we were going to want to have an impact on a town, we probably would call someone like if Ravi Zacharias, since he just died, we'll kind of use him because you look at Ravi Zacharias and, you know, he was well-educated, well-spoken of, you know, um, I mean, moral integrity, I, you know, just, I mean, he, he was there. And, and that's who humans would typically use to impact a whole town and to have, you know, a, a chain reaction. But look who Jesus used. He used a woman, when you compare educated, um, I mean, you got, had Robbie Zacharias, highly educated. You had this woman. She knew a little bit about the Messiah, but not a lot, you know. Um, and then you talk about experience, Robbie Zacharias. I mean, he was, he was talking before, you know, um, you know diplomats and kings and, uh, I mean, just leaders all over the world. And, and, you know, with, with her, she didn't have a lot of experience. Well, she had experience. She wasn't a good experience, you know. Um, and, and, and then you, you talk about moral character. You look at Robbie, you hear about him and what he did with his family. You know, it's just like, wow. And you look at her and she wasn't famous. She was infamous. And, and but again, you wouldn't think that she would be the type of person God would use. And yet that's exactly who he used because she was a person of peace. Now, let, let me mark, I mean, let me, let's remind ourselves, or let me point out, a, a person of peace is someone who accepts the messenger. You know, she accepted Jesus as the Messiah, okay? She also accepted the message. She was willing to admit, yeah, I'm a mess, but you're the Messiah, I'm coming after you. And then not only that, they understood the mission. And she went back even to people who had mocked her, ridiculed her, um, gossiped about her, uh, you know, and, and so to think about it, I mean, and even Paul is reminding us in Col Colossians 4, verse 3, about he is saying, pray for open doors. He, we are looking, the reason we go and knock on doors or go to strangers, we are looking for door openers. We're looking for that girl like Alexis who can, once she gets saved, she can go into areas that we can't and we can have a multiplied impact. And that's what a person of peace is. But, you know, they accept the messenger, they accept the message, and they, uh, they accept the mission. 
And, and so it's not just about, hey, do they like you? It's do they like Jesus? And have they surrendered? And you're looking for that person who will go on and like, you know, they finally, and the people say, hey, we not only believe because of her testimony, but we now believe and catch this right away. These Samaritans are saying he is the savior of the world. So right away, they're catching God's heart. He's not just their savior. He's the savior of the world. And that's what we're praying for. That's what we're laboring for. We're wanting to find people who will have a, a greater impact than us. And so again, you don't want to just go to strangers just to get in your gospel reps. You are believing that the fields are white for harvest and that you're willing to put yourself in uncomfortable situations so you might find that person of peace. So the real question is, when we're thinking about person of peace, you're thinking, will you be that person of peace? Will you, have you really accepted the messenger? Is he really your Lord? Have you really accepted his message and his mission? You understand you are a steward of his message, and that's the mission. That's part of your identity now. And, and how many people are you willing to go to to find that person who will grab it and go farther than you? If you just went to two people, are you willing to change your schedule? If you only had to talk to two people and find somebody like that? What about, are you willing to go to 10? What about 30, 40, 50? You know, those type of people are rare, but they're out there. And are you one of those? I think you are. And to realize that's why, you know, we're not just trying to get our gospel reps in. We're looking for that person that God's already prepared. And we're willing to practice. You know, we, we're willing to practice and to kind of get out of our comfort zone and to, to get into situations that we maybe not use the finding so we can find that door opener. And so we, we've got to challenge ourselves. And that's, are we ready to not just pray for people, but tell them our story, tell God's story. And you're going to learn that more to, uh, next week. But I, I want us to even kind of look at now, if, you know, are, are we going to be that person? But I also want us to look at very specifically of when Jesus sent his disciples out to practice, to find those people of peace. And I want us to look at a passage that's pretty familiar. But I, I want us to look at, um, you know, in uh, Luke chapter 10, in, in, um, in 1 through 10, you, you, you see, and it's all, well, Luke 10, 1 through 11, but you also see that in, we, um, uh, Justin looked at Matthew 9 and 10, and then also Mark 6. But I want us to look, and, and, he, and Jesus is highly directive. He gives a highly directive list of do's and don'ts. And I want us to look at that. Maybe let's take about 10 minutes to do that, to kind of look at what does he tell the disciples to do? And then what does he tell the disciples not to do? And then we're going to talk about, well, how does that relate to us now? And again, uh, you know, so let's, let's take, let's look, look at, again, I'll write it down in case you didn't write it down, but let's look at Luke 10, 1 through 11. And now we're looking not just for the person of peace, but we're looking for a house of peace. So in your breakout rooms, look at that and look specifically at how directed Jesus was in telling them what to do and what not to do. And we'll come back in, in about 10 minutes, okay?
Okay. All right, can we get somebody maybe that, well, I, I think I can show this. What was some, this might be a little um, hard to do this, um, but we're gonna relate a little bit and then I'm gonna let Matthew and Allie share about their experience, even this time of COVID of, of going out. And, um, you know, but, but let's, let's kind of look at, um, if y'all came up with something to just, whoa, hold on a second. Um, Did you get, you can put a thumbs up. Did you get the first thing, pray? Let me see some thumbs up. Is that the first thing? All right. He, he's given them assignment. He's making a promise. But even though he's made the promise, he is saying, you need to pray. And then, he's, you know, now earlier it says you assign them two by two and to go. So again, you know, we're not to, hey, invite them, but we're to go to them. Like Matt was sharing earlier, most people are not going. And what's the advantage of, of going two by two? I'm not saying you shouldn't share the gospel one-on-one, -on -one, because I think when you're oikos, you're going to do that. You might be in a break room, or you might be in a neighbor, and you're, you're, you don't just say, hey, how are you? You say, hey, how are you? What's really been going on lately? So you ask that second question and then you, you know, tell them your story and, and then you pr um, offer to pray for them. Um, but, um, you know, you're going to be one, you know, just one. But when you're doing something like looking for the person of peace, why do you think God sent them out two by two? All right, we got Dykus' household. I, I don't know how to unmute you. Um, for accountability. Yeah, that's a great idea. Accountability and and just you're 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 not going to have all the answers, and you're not going to. It's more fun when you do it with two people. You know, I mean, you you can because uh, again, you've got different mix, different personality. One may be more aggressive, more another one may be more um, you know uh, kind of merciful, and, and so yeah, just the accountability of um, representing the body of Christ. That's awesome. That's awesome. And then it goes on. It says, you know, to, uh, to when you enter the house, say, peace be to this house. You know, if, to understand peace, the word shalom, the Hebrew word shalom means may it be to you as in the kingdom of God. So basically, they, they were not just saying peace out. You know, they weren't doing that. They, they, was, they were saying, no, may the peace of God be with you. May you have peace in the kingdom of God. So that was the gospel. So they, they were right away bringing up the gospel. And, and uh, you know, so um, what else do you see? Did, um, did you get um, proclaiming? Then they entered the house. You know, they, um, when people opened up, they entered the house. And, and so, and they stayed with people who responded. And did you notice that the healing came after the people responded to the gospel? Now, I know in the earlier passage that Justin looked at, they were healing and casting out demons. And, you know, you might be interested, you know, we, in our little circle, most of us do not run into circles of people who are really like, I'll say, Alexa. And she's given me permission to share that. I mean, I'm not just ratting her out. I mean, you know, she... She said, yeah, I mean, God's changing. Most of us are not around a lot of drug addicts or, you know, things like that who really have some emotional things, but realize that, hey, some people, when they receive the gospel, we're, we're to stay. We're, we're not to, um, you know, um, man, we're to help them grow and be free, to be free and fruitful themselves. So um, in, anything else that we missed of what they were to do? All right. I, I guess we could kind of go in. Well, they were to shake off the dust and we'll get into that. I put it in a don't category and I'll explain why I put it in a don't category. Um, now let's look at the don'ts. Um, you might not be able to don't take money or articles with you. Why do you think that was given? And how do we relate to that now? Who wants to answer that? 
I I have one. Oh damn! I'm loud. You gotta mute them. Go ahead. Uh, Hi, Dak. Is it Dak? I, uh, I do have the impression that relationally, it's helpful. Uh, that it 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 forces you to show humility to ask for things if if you need things. Um, and so, uh, rather than being in a posture of like you have nothing to offer me, I'm just giving you things. That it kind of it helps build relationships. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, you even go back to Jesus and the woman at the well. He initially asked for water, but then he got real quick into the gospel. He didn't let it linger, did he? But he did that. And also the aspect, I don't know about you, but sometimes I have a tendency to rely on my resources, and I don't think the gospel is enough. I'll, you know, I might give them money or I might give them this or that. But I think Jesus wanted to impart to them the gospel was enough. That, um, you know, we, we don't have to really earn our right to share the gospel. The gospel alone is powerful. And so we don't, we don't have to have all the resources. But, yeah, I like to be able to be in need, too. Um, what about, um, also, what, what did you think about verse 3 when it says, um, you know, I'm sending you out among, as a lamb among wolves. Well, um, we put down. Don't be naive. In there, Tennessee, I don't know about you to think about, hey, I'm going out and doing God's work, and it should, I'm going to, it should be easy. But he, he let the disciples know right up, don't be naive. You're going out among wolves. It's not going to be an easy task, but it's worth it. So don't be naive. But it's more specifically, um, yeah. Don't move around. Once you find somebody who is responding, who, you know, and we'll, we'll go into more, I think, yes, tomorrow y'all will go into more yellow lights and green lights. But those who are receiving, stay with them, start discipling them. Um, and then um, the knocking the dust off your feet, I put it as don't take it personal if they reject you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just don't, I mean, you know, I, I, it finally dawned on me. I don't know about you, but sometimes you're going, going out sharing the gospel and, and you know, they, they end the conversation with, I'm sorry, I'm just not really interested. Any of y'all ever had that happen? Well, you know, the last time somebody said that to me, I said, oh, no, I'm the one sorry for you because you really don't understand that the kingdom of God has come near to you. I wasn't going to take it personal. I wasn't going to feel offended. I was hurting for him. But I think sometimes, you know, Jesus is just reminding us, it is tough. It is hard. Don't take it personal. But they're out there. But it's going to take us taking some time to go for it. Matthew and Allie, kind of share what y'all have experienced and even just what some things have happened in, in some of the times y'all have gone out in the neighborhood, not in a campus setting. Yeah, so Matthew and I, like Burke said, we're we're from NC State, um, and so we're pretty comfortable outreaching on a campus. Um, but then when we didn't have a campus to outreach on anymore because of COVID, it was kind of intimidating because it's like, well, what do we do now? We have to go door to door, which is kind of scary because I associate that with like Mormons knocking on your door, and I was like, I don't, I don't, I don't think my neighbors would like that. I don't know if they would receive it very well. Um, but Bert gave us some encouragement and some pointers for, for knocking on doors and going door to door in our neighborhood. And so Matthew and I set aside some time, um, started out small, just like 30 minutes because we hadn't been in a while and we were super rusty outreaching. So we're like, all right, we're going to start with 30 minutes and then we'll go longer. Um, but so we, we were like, we waited till like six o'clock. We were like, we'll give everyone time to get off work. Um, but what we didn't, intent what we didn't uh anticipate is that six o'clock is prime dinner time so we found we were knocking on a bunch of doors we we're like where the heck is everybody like everyone should be home what are what are they all doing why is no one answering um and fine so after like i don't know maybe three or four houses we finally got someone to answer um she was like i'm sorry i'm eating dinner and so we were like okay kind of like in the story we kind of dusted off our sandals because we didn't want to you know sit there and uh I guess just keep talking to her when she was obviously trying to have dinner. Um, so we moved on to the next house for someone more receptive. And we finally got 
um, one of my neighbors to answer, and she was open to conversation, um, and she let us pray for her, which was really great, and we found out that she was a believer, and that um, she said she felt comfortable sharing with people at her, her shag club. She shared with a lot of the older people and younger people there, um, and she said she was just really encouraged by that, um, and then we talked to one other neighbor who was also a believer, and we prayed for her family. Um, she was having a lot of family issues, so she was really, really grateful that we had stopped by to, to care for her. And then it didn't stop there. We were kind of discouraged because we were like, man, 30 minutes and we only talked to two people. That's, uh, it was just kind of discouraging. Um, but then the next day my mom woke up and she told me, she was like, I had two neighbors text me and they said that they were just overjoyed that you had stopped by to care for them and encourage them. Um, and then my mom also golfed with one of the other ladies. And while they were golfing, um, the neighbor that we had prayed for was telling, you know, all the, the other 10 or so ladies that were there what we had done for her. Um, and so we had only talked to two people, but from that, you know, small time that we had spent in the harvest, 10 other people um, found out about, I don't know, she might have gotten to share the gospel with her. That might have opened a door for her to share. I don't know. But um, one of the ladies that she was telling while they were golfing just started crying. And she was like, that is just so great. I'm, I'm so glad that, you know, young people like that are out sharing. Um, so yeah, that was just our story of kind of having a multiplication effect. And so, yeah, that was our experience. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you. Yeah, Matthew, you got any more to add? Or, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, we, we didn't think about all these like person of peace, um, I guess, criteria when we were out. Um, but in hindsight, looking back, I mean, you really saw the difference between you know, I guess the people who accepted us and the people who didn't really, um, because we didn't sit there. And like Ali said, we went through several different houses before we got even somebody to answer the door. Um, and then the first person who didn't, did answer the door almost immediately turned us away because they were eating. Um, and at those houses that didn't answer, we didn't sit there and knock on the door until somebody answered. And with that house that did answer, we didn't sit there and, um, you know, try to try to convince her to take our family out because she wasn't going to give us the time of day anyway. Um, we, we moved on, you know, um, we found out, you know, in, in, in hindsight, we could see that, you know, whether intentionally or not, you know, those houses at least weren't houses of peace, whether because people weren't there or whether because they weren't there, I guess, you know, emotionally to be able to listen to us. Um, but it, it's really, it's really encouraging um, to us as, as believers and as people who go on outreach to find those people, like the couple people we talked to who do, do accept us, do accept our message and accept the reason for why we, share that message um so yeah i mean i guess if anything just let that be encouragement for you guys because there are people out there who who will listen um and it's it can get discouraging but but keep going you know it's kind of one of those things where you kind of have to throw everything at the wall and what sticks is it really going to stick and it's going to help a lot um yeah but yeah, yeah just keep that in mind yeah amen thanks i mean we just got to remember that there are millions who do not know christ and i look at now when I'm knocking on doors in a neighborhood, if a door doesn't answer, um, you know, it's God's protecting me from the uh, coronavirus. Um, you know, if somebody opens the door and starts talking to me, I'm looking at, man, God, you know, they may have the virus, but they, they need to hear the gospel before they die. Um, you know, just realizing that, um, God, there's a lot going on and we're looking for people. We're not just trying to get our reps in. We've got to be praying. We've got to be believing. But we're, we're, are we willing to do what God asks us to do and model for us to find uh, you know, that person of peace? Will we be that person of peace? So I hope this has helped and just kind of think about what your schedule, what, how you can die to your calendar, die to your comfort, to, to, to be a steward of what God has left us with and find that person and be that person. All right. So, Justin, I'll turn it over to you uh, for these last few times a few minutes yeah thanks so much burke and matthew and ali appreciate hearing those stories and uh i just yeah burke I appreciate how you even ended there with dying to your comfort and dying to your calendar reminds me of luke 9 23 it said uh he was saying to them if anyone wishes to come after me he must deny himself take up his cross daily and follow me and uh i just write it's easier to sit at home it's easier to have excuses um, but, uh, but that's really what it takes. We have to die to our comfort and we have to die to our time, our calendar a lot to, to see the gospel go forth. And, um, that means different things, different people. I don't know what it means to you exactly. 
Uh, but, but just remembering that as you, as you think about God's heart for people and uh, even how you're implementing this, that's not here anymore, but they're putting this strategy uh, that we see in the scriptures. So uh, back there, yeah. Uh, so, hey, thanks for joining us today. Uh, we're going to be training. We have uh, training week continues. Uh, Wednesday and Thursday, we'll be here seven to nine. No house churches this week. We're saying come this time. If you, if you know others who missed out or whatever, uh, t- encourage them, text them. So join us next Wednesday, or not uh, this Wednesday and Thursday. We'll be here. New stuff. Uh, Wednesday, we're going to start going into field two and the gospel message. And how do we transition to that? How do we engage with others? And what do we share uh, with them? Uh, we're going to give lots of tools there and hopefully come away really encouraged and really uh, feel confident and confident in, in, in what to share with others this gospel message. Uh, same with Thursday. We'll jump into field three a little bit more. And then uh, Saturday as well. And I encourage you, Saturday, let me explain a little bit how that's going to work. Um, from 1 to like 2.30ish, we're going we're gonna to train right just like this. Uh, we'll be here at the Gordon House if you want to come in person or come on Zoom. And then after that, we're going to send you guys out into the harvest. Uh, we're going to go to different places and, and share. So if you're, if you're online and you're not even in Gainesville, I encourage you, uh, we're going to give you some ideas of how you can go out in the harvest, whether it's reaching your name's map or your neighbors or uh, some other neighborhood. Uh, but if you're here in town, we're going to reach some neighborhoods as well as, uh, and then we're going to meet back up at Depot Park. Um, and, and have some time to encourage one another. We'll be socially distant there, we'll be able to, to come together and celebrate uh, what God did in just a little bit of time in the harvest. Uh, so I encourage you guys to be planning for that. That'll be Saturday. Uh, we'll meet online from 1 to, 1 to about 2.30ish. We'll go back out, and then we'll meet back at Depot Park at 4. Um, another opportunity for you tomorrow uh, is our regular weekly prayer in the porch time uh, here in Gainesville. So if you are available and uh, you're comfortable, come on out. We're going to meet at um, we've been, we switched locations to campus to some married housing, some family housing, and we've seen a lot of, a lot more fruit there, a lot more opportunities to, to, to talk and interact with people. So uh, tomorrow we'll meet at six o'clock um, at the University Village South. You're like, where is that? Uh, that's across the street from the Harn Museum. There's some married housing, right? Family housing right there. Um, there's a pavilion there right across the street from the Harn. You meet at that pavilion, shoot us on the Discord, shoot, one, uh, shoot me or someone else a text, Matt a text. And uh, we'll make sure you be able to find that spot if you need a ride. Um, that's tomorrow from 6 to 7. Come out and join us as we're going out into the harvest. And uh, even if you've never come before, I'd say to you, some of you are like, hey, I'm not comfortable knocking on doors yet. That's okay. I encourage you from 6 to 7 tomorrow, spend time praying. Praying for us as we're out there. There's people out there. Uh, at, um, and pray for them. Pray for opportunities there for the, for the to, to interact with others and to, to share the gospel. So um, the last thing, uh, everyone has homework. So you got two nights, you got homework to do, uh, two, two things. One is your name's map. Uh, I encourage you to pray daily. Uh, take the next two days and be praying for your name's map. And maybe God will, uh, is pretty to, to interact, to talk to one of them, to text one of them, to call one of them, to share your story. Um, but, but pray for your name's map. And then the other assignment you have, the other homework assignment you have is, is you're running no believer. Between now and when we train again on Wednesday, I imagine you're going to run into another believer. I'd love for you to share uh, the five fields, uh, five parts, four fields with them. Uh, just give a brief overview of the plan that we talked about and Jesus' plan, uh, strategy, and then how, uh, how even what you're learning from that. And invite them to, hey, come learn with me the next, uh, the next couple parts and how, how, this, uh, how this works by reaching, um, reaching the nations. So, so two, homework assignment, a lot of game right there, but the homework assignment is pray for your names map and share uh, with the believer um, the five fields, four parts. And if you can, join us tomorrow at six, or uh, we'll see you Wednesday at seven for training. Thanks so much. Let me close this in prayer. We'll call it a night. So Lord, thank you so much. Um, just for the reminder of your heart for people, Lord. From the beginning, uh, you've always wanted to uh, desire for the nations. And thank you that you want to use us, Lord, your amb- as your ambassadors to reach people, to share, to proclaim the kingdom and share with them how they can have a uh, reconciled relationship with you. Lord. Thank you that you did that for me, Lord. Thank you you sent someone to share with me I uh, thank you for, for Pastor Lundin and others who, who are the example of the gospel to me, Lord, who, who proclaim that to me. Lord. And Lord, I thank you for each person here who's listening, Lord, and pray for each one of us as we want to become people of peace, Lord. Uh, and we want to be searching for those people of peace and those houses of peace. Lord, use us, uh, Lord. We pray until, use us until you return, Lord. We pray that soon and help us to be um, uh, per, uh, persevering until then, Lord. Persevering in, in the gospel, persevering and making disciples to make disciples. We love you. Thank you. Thank you for this time. Thank you, brothers. You got to join us, uh, Lord. And we just, uh, yeah, just lift up the rest of our evenings to you, Lord. Use us in any way, even today and tomorrow as we, um, I just want to serve you, Lord. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
Thanks, everyone. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow or yeah, tomorrow or Wednesday. Bye. 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 Well, let's see who's the last one. Wow. Well, I'll be the last one. Nope. We will. Oh, it's a challenge now. Okay, okay. I think I mean, we, we, can we can hang. I'm cool. It's fine. I don't have to go to work tomorrow. I definitely have to go to work tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> don't, 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 it's Justin. Don't.